Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the chance to talk to you um, about a really fun story and kind of accidental coming upon um, the story of exifers. I think that biology that we'll talk about has a, a touches on many um, issues in neurodegeneration and brain aging. And kind of stepping back a little bit, we, we think of this as kind of modeling aggregate and organelle transfer in the living nervous system. OK, so my lab studies aging, um, and uh, in particular neuronal aging. And um, there are two kind of really bad things that can happen to an aging neuron. One is protein aggregation, which kind of underlies virtually all of uh, the neuro horrible neurodegenerative diseases that we know about. And the other is mitochondrial dysfunction for many, um, for many reasons. Now, cells have a, a devote a lot of energy and gear to maintaining um, the proteome and um, mitochondria. And this includes um, these very large networks of chaperones, proteasome degradation, and autophagy on the proteostasis side, and mitophagy on the mitochondrial side. But recently, it's, oh, and just want to emphasize a little bit. So these are degradative processes or, or maintenance processes that are all executed within the neuron. And they take care of little garbage, uh, much like maybe your, um, your garbage disposal. Um, but we know now um, that there's another problem in neurodegenerative disease, and that is that aggregates in mitochondria can pass between cells. And when they do, they spread pathology. So this is a major factor in um, neurodegenerative disease, but it's super hard in these higher complex organisms to figure out how and why, these, uh, why this is happening. So enter the marvelous um, little tiny worm that I work on. Uh, this is um, C. elegans. For people who ha are not familiar with it, it's a tiny animal, one millimeter big. It only has 959 um, cells, and 302 of those are neurons. The features that make it um, particularly useful for our the talk on exifers are that it's transparent, so you can see through um, the animal and look at individual cells and see what's happening, and uh, the strong genetics, and it's really easy to make um, transgenic lines, for example, fluorescently labeled cells or um, organelles. Um, and the reason that we can kind of get away with spending all this attention on tiny little worms is that um, time, time and time again, the basic biological mechanisms prove to be conserved. And in that way, we hope that what we learn, the lessons in the, in the little nematode, will inform and help our colleagues who are studying phenomenon in, in mammalian um, organisms. Um, so in C. elegans, um, there are 302 neurons, but I'm going to be focusing actually kind of on one neuron mostly, but um, members of this group of six touch receptor neurons. Two things I want to tell you about those. First is that um, their job in the body is to respond to gentle touch. So if you touch an animal with an eyelash hair attached to a toothpick, it will move away, and those neurons sense that um, initial touch. And there, so there is a behavioral assay, crude though it may be, that we can um, think about for these cells. And secondly, um, there, there are only six of them, and they're very easy to see. So in the bottom, you can see these, um, uh, I think this one's GFP labeled. But you can see how easy it is to see both the soma, the cell body, and the process. So these are critical. In work that um, an undergraduate in my lab was doing, so this is Ilya Malentievich. What he was doing is studying how neurons age. Pretty cool in worms. You can actually look at a neuron the entire life of the animal, which is only three weeks. Um, but anyway, he came in my office, and he, he said that he saw these very strange things, um, fluorescent things outside of the neuron in neurons that were fluorescently labeled. And they were rare, um, and um, we were kind of dismissive of them, but he maintained the interest. And he gets all the credit for making, for tracking them down and the discovery of this exifer. Um, and so basically, I hope that'll play again. But basically, here's the process, here's the soma, and you can see what's happening is that in the context of the, the native animal, um, although you can't see the rest of it, you can see that this M-cherry, which is a marker really kind of overexpressed in this neuron, 
is being selectively extruded. So Ilya got to name this. He called it exifer for um, exo outside, and fur has a root in the word ca to carry away. And you can kind of see that this happens by a major budding out process, much like you would fill a water balloon. Um, when the exifer leaves, it leaves with a plasma membrane around it. And you can also see that it concentrates um, specific cargoes. Um, what you can't see in that video, but is, seems to be pretty characteristic, is that initially in the biogenesis of this um, exifer, I don't know if you can see that, but here's a, here it's easier to see. Um, there's a connection. So there's kind of a delay in the dissociation, and this connection resembles a tunneling nanotube. It has microtubules and actin in it, and things can transport from the soma into the exifer. So the, the major loading takes place during this budding out, but other things can, like um, calcium aggregates and organelles can transfer. And we're particularly excited about this um, because this, this tunneling nanotube transfer mechanism has been suggested as a way of transfer of things like prions in, um, in uh, neurodegenerative disease. Okay, so that's another feature of them. There are three points that I want to make quickly about exivers in the context of the whole animal. First of all, I'm going to be talking to you a lot about um, the touch neuron exivers, but these, the rules apply to multiple neuron types. Different types of neurons can make these. But within, even within the touch receptor neurons, um, and these are just the name of the, the six touch receptor neuron type, they don't all make exifers with the same avidity. ALMR makes them the, the most in the hermaphrodite, and many of our assays really focus on this. The other point comes from looking at this graph. Even in cells that are you know, doing the best job of making them in neurons, we don't always see them. They occur in a measurable, but not um, a huge amount. For the touch receptors that we look at, mostly um, the, we see them in from like 10 to 20 percent of the of the animals and other cell types can make them so I'm telling you a neuron story kind of but actually we think it applies to other cells have been reported in muscle we've seen them in celomocytes and um, we think multiple cell types can make them okay so um, a point or two about what exifers are not. They're really different from exosomes, despite the sad um, connection in names. Exifers are about 100 times larger, so um, close to four microns in diameter and average in, in our system. Um, and they occur by a different biogenesis, this kind of budding out rather than packaging vesicles and, and releasing them. Um, and they also pr seem to involve different um, gene sets for biogenesis. Um, they're also not just the consequence of expressing a large amount of a fluorophore, um, like the M. cherry. So we can label C. elegans neurons different ways. This is dye filling, um, because there are some neurons that are open to the environment and you can backfill them. And when we um, label them in this way, we can also see exifers happening. So we are convinced that exifers form under normal physiological conditions I don't have a lot of time to talk about um, what those might be today, but we have a whole story on that that I'm happy to talk after the talk. Okay, so one thing that is absolutely true is that exifer production increases under conditions of proteostress. I'm going to show you one example um, based on models of um, polyglutamine expansion as occurs in Huntington's disease. And these models were pioneered by Christian Neary, who is here uh, at this meeting, and um, Rick Morimoto. But basically, um, if you have a long expansion, such as 128 cues, um, this, this protein becomes neurotoxic. Shorter ones are not. Um, if you express this poly-Q128 cyanFP in the touch neurons, you can see aggregating in the soma. Um, and here's a little budding exifer. Um, where you can see that almost all of that poly Q seems to be going into the domain that will become an exifer. And this is a different example, but a more advanced exifer, you can see connected, in which it looks like almost all of that polyglutamine aggregate is, is going to be removed in that exifer. And this complete removal happens, not always, but in about half of the time, um, it actually really clears. 
And um, it's also true that in those long poly Q, Q128 is, um, per, induces more exifers than um, a, um, a shorter poly Q expansion. So um, we've looked at this in a number of examples. So the M cherry that I showed you at the beginning is very high expression, poly Q128. The Alzheimer's disease fragment, A beta 1 for 42, if you overexpress those toxic proteins, you make more exifers. Um, if you impair the chaperones or autophagy or the proteosome, in all these cases, we think protein aggregation and proteostasis is, is misaligned and exifer numbers go up. Um, it's also true that more systemic things um, like osmotic stress, here these are just kind of equivalent osmotic measures, but you can see they increase the number of exifers. And oxidative stress, successive um, increasing amounts of juglone, um, which is a mitochondrial oxidative stressor, um, increase exifers, but I want to point out something that we think is kind of interesting, and that is that, they, that you get an increasing response up to a point. Okay, so more, more stress, more stress, more stress, more exifers, more exifers, more exifers. Um, but all of a sudden, um, if things get too bad, this, this response shuts down. So the way that we're thinking about it is that normally cells by those um, pathways of proteostasis that I told about at the beginning, um, you use these internal um, homeostasis mechanisms and they do the job. In, um, if things get pretty bad, um, you will make an exifer. And if um, there is a situation where things that you overstress, then this exifer response kind of stops. So we actually think that's kind of interesting, and um, it's something that we're trying to figure out. So the, what I've told you so far is we think elevated aggregates or proteostresses um, induce high levels of exifer, and the idea is that exifer genesis is a response to kind of overloaded um, proteostasis capacity. Okay. Now, um, to look at these exivers forming is somewhat horrifying. Um, they are really big, um, especially compared to the, the soma. They're about the size of the soma. So how can this be good for a neuron? Well, you know, we don't get to, you know, our job is to ultimately understand, but it looks like the neuronal consequences of making these um, exivers is not that bad. So um, what is true is when the exiver is forming, Prior to its forming, the cell actually swells. It increases its volume a little bit. And after, it, after the event, in general, comes about to 80%. The soma comes back to about 80% its normal size. And within 24 hours, it's back to normal size. So it doesn't really take a huge permanent hit in its size. Um, we think some garbage is thrown out or some things are thrown out, but not everything. So, um, so there's a selective extrusion. Um, and so that's not necessarily harmful. Um, the neurons, after they make an exifer, we do not see them die. In fact, if we um, do that little simple touch test, we never see, even right after you made an exifer, 24 hours later, and all these experiments, I should say, are done blind um, to knowing if it made an exifer or not, um, the, the touch circuit still functions. So we can't find a functional de deficit um, as a consequence of making an exifer. And if in that Q128 strain that I showed you, um, that made an, in that Q128 strain, we can take advantage of the fact that um, some neurons, even though they're the same genotype and making the Q128, some make an exifer, some don't. The ones that made an exifer retain their touch sensitivity better. So overall, um, it seems that this, that this um, uh, response can actually be neuroprotective. Okay, so um, the other component of being so such a huge vesicle is you can probably take a lot with you. And so we wondered at the beginning, can organelles be extruded? And um, the answer is yes, um, you can extrude. This is an example of lysosomal extrusion. In this particular case, um, the lysosome is making up the entire exifer, but there are, uh, there are many cases which their lysosomes come as a subset of a larger exifer component. Our um, electron microscopy suggested that there was a lot of rough ER in the, in the exifers. We were really surprised at that, but we put a tag on a rough ER marker, and here's the so 
uh, how it looks in the soma, but this exifer you can see is full, uh, or you know has a lot of the rough ER. Mitochondria can be extruded. This is some work of um, Joelle Smart, and um, who has studied the exifers. So in a, usually the soma has a nice kind of networked appearance, um, and you can see the exifers contain a fair number of mitochondria. So the thing, the only thing that we didn't see. And, and this is true, that we do not see the nucleus leave in the exifer. And this makes sense if the neuron has to, you know, continue functioning through the life of the animal. Um, so we did this initially by looking at DAPI staining, and that's um, shown in blue. And this is the sending um, soma, and here's an exifer which is expressing M. cherry and some um, mitochondria. So, but recently we found this really weird thing. So this is the first um, weird thing that I want to share with you. And that is that the nucleus actually releases vesicles that are inside of exifers. And so what you're looking at in this sequence is a strain that both express M. cherry and a nuclear inner membrane um, marker called MR1. So, uh, okay. So here is the red channel, the M cherry. This is exactly what we saw before. Okay, here's the soma left behind. Nucleus looks a little dark, and the exiver has most of the M cherry. But when um, Rebecca Androwski, a wonderful postdoc in the lab, looked at a nuclear inner membrane marker, MR1, it's blazing in the nucleus as expected. But what she saw was a surprising um, little nuclear um, derived. Um, component that is kind of a subset of the exifer. And this is, this actually is not rare. Um, like the majority, 83%, will have this um, subvesicle. And um, she started looking what's in and what's out. Some things are out. So a nuclear pore protein marker, um, MPP12, you don't need to know, but in a nuclei, uh, marker for the nucleolus called FIS1, those are excluded. They don't go out in the vesicle. But what goes out in the vesicle that we know of so far is this MR1 and lamin, an inner membrane protein. So the big question is whether, whether nucleic acids are going out with this. And it turns out that the answer to that question is yes. If we look at, so here's the MR1, so nucle, nu, nucleus blazing a little bit um, in this vesicle that's inside the exifer. Um, and if you look hard, you can actually see a tiny bit of DAPI, which is a stain for um, DNA. This, again, is not super rare. It happens in about half of the vesicles that, um, the nuclear vesicles that Becky has looked at. So, um, so this is really curious. We don't know what kind of DNA, how much, um, is it specific? What's, is, do these exifers actually also have some role in genome integrity maintenance? And I might also add, we don't know why this thing that's the vesicle that's being excluded doesn't seem to be just a lop off of all the um, nucleus. So there's something specific about it. So those are some mysteries that we're dealing with. And so this is the first mini story that I want to tell you. Um, that C. elegans, very large exifers, also include nuclear extrusions as subcompartments within these cytoplasmic exifers. And um, the, these compartments can contain nuclear inner membrane proteins and some DNA. Um, and just as a note, I'll remind you that these exifers are mixed bags. That they have, they can co-eliminate aggregates, organelles, and nuclear vesicles. Okay. Um, the next little story I want to tell you is about exifergenesis. Um, and you know, when you think of it, there's so many interesting stories. Like, how did you select cargo? How do you put it on one side of the cell? How you know, what's the trigger that for makes you make an exifer? What are the dynamics? What's the nature of scission? And so, I'm going to try and tell you um, one little mini story here. And to do so, I have to back up a little bit and um, tell you about mammalian agrosomes. So. Um, if you introduce like a Huntington, expanded Huntington um, protein into a mammalian culture cell um, and it's labeled, you can get these um, little aggregates that um, coalesce and ultimately are put in this juxtanuclear compartment that's called an agrosome. 
this, the biology of this has been um, fairly well understood. Adapters recognize protein that's either unfolded or ubiquinated. Um, they get attached to motors that travel down the mi microtubules, and they go to this site that's surrounded by intermediate filaments. Okay. Um, I really don't have time to go into it, but the Seligans agrosome formation genes are conserved with those in humans. Um, and um, if you look, for example, at intermediate filament D1 and D2, in those touch neurons under stress, you can see them, um, here's um, one, here's two, um, and they get together in these juxtanuclear domains. This is also true for um, ubiquitin, um, sequest, HSP1, and intermediate filaments. Um, and poly-Q can be inside those foci. So agrosome biology seems to be conserved. Why am I telling you about this? Because it turns out that many components of agrosome biology turn out to influence exifer rates. And again, I don't have time to go through, but here's one pathway um, where adapters bring um, garbage into the agrosome, and we find that getting rid of the the HSP1 equivalent of HSP70, a 1433 adapter protein um, called FTT2 in worm speak. Um, and these two intermediate filaments um, are, are exifer suppressors. That means that normally these contribute to the generation of exifers. And let's see. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, just show you that the exifers are down um, in IFD1 deletion, IFD2 compared to wild type. And um, they, if you make a double, they are about the same, so they likely act through the same pathway. And we can rescue these by expression only in touch neurons. So this is a cell autonomous process. Um, okay, the reason that we think this is really interesting um, is that Intermediate filaments are increasingly implicated in proteostasis. They're major components of Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease, and they're actually clinical markers of neuronal injury. They're circulating. So um, I told you that, that agrosome biology can influence the level of exifers. They can also be extruded in exifers. So, um, and again, this is often but not always associated with the poly-Q ag aggregate. Um, this actually suggests a new way that agrosomes might be cleared. Agrosomes are thought to be cleared by lysosomal engagement in the, in the host cell, um, but possibly they get thrown out, and possibly this throwing out may actually be relevant to understanding how in the clinic these markers are getting out. So, um, and I uh, can say that if we take the human um, intermediate filament, neurofilament light, and put it into the worm that's deficient for intermediate filament two, we can see that um, the human um, intermediate filament is, is, delete, is um, eliminated in exifers and can partially complement for the function. So this is exciting and suggests a conserval of human intermediate filaments in extrusion biology. Okay, so um, in the last minute, I'm going to whip through um, just to a summary of um, these other questions about um, the fate of the extruded exifer. I just want to tell you that um, the, in this model, the exifer is, the touch neuron is bedded, embedded in the hypodermis, which um, recognizes it, I guess I won't say that, um, kind of recognizes um, this extrusion and um, uh, then undergoes a process of phagocytosis and lysosomal breakup. Um, and that process is super interesting. There is a SED1, which is the fly draper mammalian meg F10 homolog recognition of just the exifer, so exifer in red. Um, and that process seems to actually require the pulling um, in order to make, um, in order to mature the exifer. So um, I'm going to skip for the interest of time what um, the summary is, but I want to emphasize to you that we're excited that learning more about this mechanism may inform on um, mechanisms of spreading in neurodegenerative disease. And I want to close by saying that, um, that 
In mammalian biology, there are a number of examples now, and I hope to hear more of them at this meeting. Um, if this is probably hard for students to see, I'm happy if you just take down my email. Um, I'm happy to um, send the list, the reading list of these, all these exciting examples. And then I'll just leave this up to, um, I tried to remember to mention people as we went along, but I wanna especially um, shout out to my colleague, excellent cell biologist, Barth Grant, um, for his um, contributions to all this work. So um, thank you so much. Maybe I'll put, although it's very important what they did, I'm gonna leave that up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica, for this amazing presentation and for sharing all of your data. I can start with the first question. We, we can have only another question uh, in interest of time. I find it very fascinating that, as you correctly said, these exophers do not resemble the exosomes in any way. However, because they form from the uh, external part of the body, they could resemble ectosomes, which can be as small yes. as the exosomes, but also significantly larger. And in particular, I found very fascinating that you mentioned the presence of nuclear component, DNA, emerine and laminin that we have found in large oncosomes. So I wonder if some of the biogenetic processes uh, could be so conserved and, and yes. be similar. Yeah, so we're really excited um, about going back. So when we initially discovered this, we did some fast studies, and we didn't have the same tools for targeting knockdowns in the neuro C. elegans neurons that we have now. And so we're really interested in now going through the, the list very carefully and rigorously to see what is in common, what requirements are in common and are not. But yes. It's, Thank you. A question there? Hey, uh, that was a great talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, the biogenesis okay. of exophiles. So in your, the video what you showed where the soma is moving and uh, there's a body coming out from the soma, isn't that kind of similar to microsomes and the biogenesis of exophiles is kind of similar to that? And my second question is, uh, you, show, you spoke about TNTs and that's one of my favorite topics. Okay, good. <laughs> and like, so is, is a transfer of biomolecules between the exophere and the cells by TNT, is it like a two-way traffic or is it just one way? So, um, so to answer your, your second question first, um, we have observed kind of things moving from the soma into the exophere, but we have not rigorously quantitated whether it's unidirectional. So it looks unidirectional, but I'm not sure. Um, the second question is the relationship to microsomes. Um, we would love to think that all these large vesicle extrusion biologies are kind of grounded in some really fundamental mechanisms. And so it's something that, um, that we'd like to look at much more carefully. Thank you. We can, we can have a couple of more quick questions, please. Johannes Grilari from uh, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute, Vienna. Very nice talk. Uh, to, to me, the exophil mechanism uh, resembles a bit uh, the damage segregation in uh, asymmetric cell division, as we know it from, from yeast mother cell aging or uh, stem cell renewal. Do you think that this, is a, that this mechanism might be comparable to uh, damage segregation in uh, uh, in, in, in that case, in, in the sense that here you don't have a cell division, obviously, in the postmitotic cells, uh, which, but then still the, the mechanism resembles the segregation of uh, the mitosis, and that's why it, some DNA comes along. Right. So, um, so yes, I think these things could be um, related to each other. I guess I can fill in a slide that I skipped, which was um, that um, in terms of the um, asymmetric, but asymmetric cell division, there are certain components like central spindlin um, components are re-recruited to that event. There are other components of, of cell division and scission that appear not to be critical. So we're sorting through now to kind of understand. It's, it's a really weird thing for neurons to do. We think it's really fascinating. We hope to take lessons from other um, models in order to um, learn more. Thank you. Hey, this is Nasli Kodayari from University of Florida. That was a great talk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I do have a question about like 
what is the final fate of these exophers if they are carrying like this functional mitochondria or big chunk of uh, like unfolded protein which they are in inclusion bodies and they are hard to like disrupt, what happens to them when they release into the plasma or they circulate right. because they're pretty big? So super interesting. Um, most of the material gets degraded in the lysosomal network, like the mitochondria really take a beating in the mitochondrial network of the, the engulfing cell, which is the hypodermal cell. But what's really cool is these aggregates or the M cherry can't really get degraded and they get re extruded into the fluid of the animal, the pseudocilome, and they actually travel to another set of scavenger cells where they're taken, where the M cherry is taken up and stays forever. Like you can see those, sta those, those cells just hold it like a, um, like a landfill. Um, and so there is partially successful degradation, but um, the stuff that can't be handled gets stored remotely. Thank you. Very, very quick, please. Yeah, actually, I think it's, it's already answered, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I wanted okay. to just ask, like, have you seen uh, these, uh, about the fate of these exo exomers? So have you seen any, anything like if they have any preferential binding to the healthy neurons? within the C. elegans? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So the model that we see, that we look at, um, the interaction of the matured exifer is really with this hypodermal cell. Um, we are, are really interested in um, trying to track transfer from a neuron to a neuron, um, but we haven't seen that yet. And so, yes, my answer to your question is we don't know. Christian, yeah. last question. Yeah, exciting talk, Monica. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the neuroprotective role of these exophers. Uh, we know a lot about the suppressors um, of the MAC phenotype that is induced by the HD protein in, in this, uh, this C-elegance neuron. So to make it short, I mean, do you have any data on whether there might be a one-to-one -one relationship between genetic suppression and a variation in the amount of exophers that are secreted by the yeah, touch so, receptor neurons. So this is a very good question. We haven't done it, done that experiment in the way that I would like to say. What I can say is that if we use RNAi approaches to knock down the levels of M. cherry, we can knock down the levels of exophers. But a really quantitative analysis um, kind of awaits to be done. We suspect that the protein level is actually something that's pretty important. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, Monica, for this uh, illuminating uh, lecture on a very important mechanism of biology. Thank you. Thanks so much.